Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the U3A in the Overberg region. We are delighted to have Valerie Shrimplin with us this morning, all the way from St. Albans in the UK. And my guess is that those of you watching this presentation are here for possibly a variety of reasons. One is that you have previously heard Valerie's excellent presentations. Secondly, you may have a particular interest in Sir Christopher Wren and his amazing career over a life that was exceedingly long, especially for those years. Thirdly, I know there are people with a particular interest in St. Paul's Cathedral. So for all these reasons, Valerie, we look forward to listening to you. For those of you who don't remember, Valerie is a fellow of the amazing institution Gresham College. You can Google that and learn a great deal of interest and get wonderful information. She uh, was originally from St. Albans, but she spent time in South Africa. And so she obtained her doctorate in South Africa in the history of art. And it is on topics related to that that she has previously addressed us. But now we look forward very much to hearing of Sir Christopher Wren. Thank you, Valerie. Well, thank you, Caroline, for that introduction. I'd just like to say I'm not actually a fellow, I'm a research associate. But thank you for that introduction. I'll be talking about Gresham College as well as talking about Sir Christopher Wren. And I'll just explain my first slide, truly iconic, I call it, because I, I, it really annoys me how the word iconic is so overused nowadays, everything is iconic. But I think with Sir Christopher Wren here, he is really, truly iconic. So I just wanted to make that clear. As you all know, it's 300 years since Sir Christopher Wren's death at the age of 19, 17, 23. And so I'll be talking about his life and work and times, and especially sort of focusing on St Paul's Cathedral as a, as a kind of case study. Sir Christopher Wren, here we have a portrait of him by Godfrey Nella in 1711, and it was labelled the late Christopher Wren, so the image was painted now as if he was in his prime. And so I'm going to talk about his background, his early life and career, and then his career actually falls into two areas, astronomy and also architecture. Most people think about Sir Christopher Wren as an architect, but in fact, he was a well-known astronomer before he became an architect. And he would have been a, a well-known as an astronomer if he'd never done any architecture at all. So he was Gresham Professor of Astronomy, and I'll explain a bit about Gresham College as we go along. He was a founder member of the Royal Society in London. He was also a Professor of Astronomy at Oxford. His architecture was, was sort of later life, although he was still very young, but it followed on from his astronomical work, and he was important in various designs. And I've sort of, to make it easier to follow, I sort of split it up into his work on universities and university buildings, ecclesiastical buildings, uh, scientific aspects, and also royal buildings, including royal palaces. And astronomy will be sort of covered in the case study of St Paul's Cathedral in London, because I feel that St Paul's Cathedral is where his two careers of astronomer and architect actually overlap. Now, Robert Hooke, um, the famous mathematician and polymath, wrote that since the time of Archimedes, there scarce ever met in one man so great a perfection and such a mechanical hand and so philosophical a mind as Sir Christopher Wren. So we're going to look at it in those terms and how he came from East Noyle in Wiltshire. This is a village about 100 miles west of, of London. And there's a picture of the little parish church to St Paul's Cathedral and how he got from this tiny village to become the most famous architect of probably the most iconic landmark building in London. His early life and education was at East Noyle, where his father was the rector and, and vicar of the parish. He had a rather nice early childhood. There is a plaque commemorating in a house near where he was born. 
in 1632. His father later became Dean of Windsor. Now, this is very important because of Windsor Castle, which is actually going to feature a, a lot at the coronation next weekend. Wren's father became Dean of Windsor in 1635. His uncle Matthew was the Bishop of Ely. So these are quite important, very high positions and very high posts. He was rather sickly child, so he had a home tutor and Christopher Wren was tutored locally, but he particularly excelled in Latin and drawing and mathematics. And then he went off to Westminster School in London when he was a bit older. Now, on the left, we have a portrait of Christopher Wren the Elder. His father was also called Christopher. Actually, his son was also called Christopher as well. And this is the rectory in the late 17th century. The actual building they lived in was replaced by this in due course. But this is the sort of area where he lived. And in fact, this house is for sale at the moment, if anybody's got two and a half million pounds to spare. So that's where he lived until they went off to Windsor. And the most important thing about being at Windsor is the royal connections. The royalist connections are incredibly important with Sir Christopher Wren. And I'll just do a quick reminder here of the English Civil War for those of you who might be less familiar. So Christopher Wren was from a royalist family. They supported the monarchy, the Stuarts, Charles I. And because his father was Dean of Windsor at St George's Chapel in Windsor, his father would have known Charles I well. And Sir Christopher Wren was only two years different in age from Charles I's son, Charles II. So they probably played together as children. His father was actually later imprisoned twice for his royalist sympathy after Charles I was executed in 1649 and the period of Cromwell was 1642 to 1658. Christopher Wren's uncle, the Bishop of Ely, was also a staunch royalist and he actually spent 18 years in the Tower of London for his pains. But when the monarchy was restored after Cromwell died in 1658, then the family came into their own again and they were rewarded in a way for having supported the royalists during the time of Cromwell. So the restoration of the monarchy came about in 1660. And here we have Charles II, who was very flashy and quite a character. But the point is, and what is important here is that Sir Christopher Wren would have been playmates with Charles II while he was at Windsor when his father was the rector there. So if you just bear that in mind as we go through this royal connection, the royalist patronage was very, very important. Sir Christopher Wren's early interests were in science and astronomy, and these are documented well. He was interested in sundials, and I've got an example here on the right, of the sort of sundial that would be in use at the time. He did observational work as early as the age of 13, particularly looking at the moon through telescopes, which were sort of taking off then. He was also interested in looking at armillary spheres. There's an example on the left of an armillary sphere by Rowley in about 1700, which is in the History of Science Museum in Oxford. Or if you look at the little ivory at the bottom, towards the right-hand corner. This is a portable sundial, which is from Nuremberg from the early 17th century. Using these sort of instruments, even as a child, he was looking at phases and movements. He was interested in terrestrial magnetism, but also medical experiments, things like circulation of the blood, experimenting on animals, transfusions, a splenectomy was performed on, on actually on a dog. But the idea was, this was a totally new approach from the 16th century, looking at experiment as a way of testing hypotheses. So we're not just sort of speculating, but really thinking of a hypothesis and then testing it through, through experiment, which was a very important approach. As well as these modern ideas and science, he was also had an, an early interest in the arts and the classics. And these drawings that he did from an early stage were copying the classical, the, the Greek and Roman ideas and Vitruvius's 10 books on architecture, which was in the first century BC. In Vitruvius, which Sir Christopher Wren would have been familiar with, 
Vitruvius demonstrates how the architect, quote, should be acquainted with astronomy and the theory of the heavens. So this is really important. There's a lot of astronomy in Vitruvius's book on architecture, which was the textbook on architecture at the time, talking about astronomy, the zodiac planets, the sun and the moon and the constellations, but also talking about the classical orders and these classical designs. And if you bear these in mind, you can see how these came to the fore in Wren's designs as he became an architect. For his early career, he went off to what am College in Oxford, where he got a bachelor's and a master's degree, and then he became a fellow of All Souls Oxford. He increasingly specialised in astronomy and lunar surveys, and he was appointed as the Gresham Professor of Astronomy in 1657. And it's important to remember that at Wadham College, Oxford, although Oxford was quite radical and forward thinking, it was a very royalist college again, and he met Robert Hooke at Oxford too. Now, just to digress slightly to explain about Gresham College, Gresham College in London was founded by Sir Thomas Gresham, who, as you can see, lived during the 16th century. But when his son and heir died, he founded a college which became the focus of scientific life in the capital at the time. And he appointed professors who gave free lectures for the public. And also it was important because they were in English rather than in simply in Latin. And they were based on practice rather than theory. So astronomy, for example, at Gresham College was taught for navigation and meteorology. Gresham was a merchant. He made a lot of money as he served all the Tudor monarchs. He was a financier, a merchant a royal agent. He basically kept his head down and kept it on through the Tudor period. And we know that Sir Christopher Wren was appointed there. And we know also the detail that he lectured on Wednesdays. And we also actually have a script of his inaugural lecture where he made lots of references to classical Greek and Roman architecture. He referred to astronomy and geography and exploration and navigation. He referred in this, his first lecture as professor to Christopher Columbus and to the works of Copernicus, Galileo and Kepler. So he was very interested in astronomy at this time. And also the, the planets, Saturn, elliptical orbits and so on. And all this was before he became an architect. Now, at Gresham College, the minute books are, still exist and there's a, a meeting called the Grand Gresham Committee, which still meets and I attended its meetings when I worked at Gresham College. But the minute books from the 17th century are absolutely fascinating. You can see where I've encircled the name here, but you can see he was appointed as Professor of Astronomy and it describes Mr. Christopher Wren, who was there and was appointed as the astronomy professor. Later on, in 1660, he actually resigned for various reasons. And here is the note from the Book of Minutes where he resigned in, in 1660. Now, the reason he did this was because with a group of friends, he set up another association. So on a, on a deep and dark and rainy November evening in 1660, and since it's London in the end of November 1660, it's a fairly safe bet that it was dark and dreary and rainy and cold. But on this evening, Christopher Wren, Hook Boyle, the, the physicist, set up a society for the promotion of physico-mathematical experimental learning. Now, this is the oldest scientific academy in continuous existence, and it is still significant. It's still promoted life-changing ideas. It still, it then and, and later, still promotes and sponsors the most eminent scientists and discoveries in science, engineering, and medicine. And it recognized, promoted, and supported excellence in science. And still, its, its main tenant is to uh, encourage the development and use of science for the benefit of humanity. And so after Wren's lecture finished that, that evening, this group of men all, all met and 
founded what was to become the Royal Society. It was given the epithet royal by Charles II after the Restoration. And you can see from Ben's portrait on the right that he was he was rather flamboyant character at this, at this time. Now his career as an astronomer, as he grew older, was getting more technical. He did a lot of work on the observations of the moon, the satellites. You can see from the drawing on the right, the satellites of Jupiter, the rings of Saturn and how these were elliptical. He worked on cosmology and the prediction of solar eclipses. The aids to navigation, as I said, the practical aspect of his work were really important. Telescopes, astrolabes, solving the longitude problems, optics and meteorology. He worked with Robert Boyle. His work actually influenced Sir Isaac Newton in his Principia Mathematica on the motion around the sun. So he was at the Royal Society in 1660. But then in 1661, he went off to Oxford and became the civilian professor of astronomy, where he remained for seven years. In fact, the, the Gresham professorship of astronomy predated these professorships at Oxford and Cambridge. But then what was really strange was that in the early 1660s, there was a career change to architecture. And this was brought about by Charles II, the king, who, after the restoration, as I mentioned, came into his own, as did the royalists who had supported him, like Sir Christopher Wren. Wren was in, involved uh, in the repair of the old St Paul's Cathedral in London as an architect engineer. This seemed to be due to his skills in maths and engineering. What's really strange is he was appointed to design the fortifications in Tangier, which was part of the dowry of Charles II's Portuguese wife. He didn't actually go, but the strange thing is, why was he chosen to do this? He'd never actually built anything. He was an astronomer. But I think it was because in return for his loyalty, for his architectural ambition, he became the surveyor general of the king's work because he was talented and because his potential was recognised. He actually hadn't built anything to this point and he didn't go to Tangiers, but as a result of this, his architectural career seemed to take off. Now, what was particularly significant was that in 1665, he visited Paris. Now you can see the picture here is not of Paris. This is St. Peter's in Rome. When Sir Christopher Wren was in Paris, he met Bernini, he studied his work, now, the image here, you can tell, is, is of St. Peter's in Rome. And Benini designed the piazza in front of St. Peter's. And St. Peter's was largely designed by Michelangelo. The Dome of St. Peter's and the Dome of St. Paul's by Christopher Wren are often compared. But as well as looking at studies, talking to Benini, meeting him, finding out about his grandiose Baroque style. This all inspired Wren tremendously. It was a huge, momentous meeting. He just dabbled in architecture before this, and now he became absolutely devoted to it. And as well as looking at Benini's designs, was also looking at things like the layout of Paris, the boulevards and things which Bernini influenced so much when he was in Paris. So we've got the influences coming in here from Paris and Rome through his visit to Paris and his meeting with Benini. We mustn't forget, however, that Sir Christopher Wren was a politician and courtier as well. He wasn't a, an, an architect or an artist working in a garret by any means. He was a courtier. These royalist connections in his early life and through his father developed enormously as he got older. He entered politics. He became an MP four times, although he wasn't enormously active as an MP. He did have a family life. He resigned from Oxford. He seemed to be more interested in London. London was where it's at, as it were, to use uh, modern terminology. And he was the surveyor of the King's works until 1718 and a foremost quarter amongst the inner circle of royalists during the Restoration. He got married and his son Christopher was born. A lot of the information about him, his son 
wrote a biography of his father. It was called Parentalia, about his parent and the memoirs of the family. But Wren's wife died very soon and he remarried. But then his second wife died as well. So he was actually only married for seven years in total. He also became knighted later on as well. And here we have the Nella portrait as well, showing an image of him of what Wren looked like in his prime. Looking in more detail now at the architectural work, there are work he did in universities and colleges in Oxford and Cambridge, the ecclesiastical work, St Paul's, but there, don't forget, there were 51 other Wren churches in London, and his scientific work, the monument in London, the Greenwich Observatory, and then finally his, the Chelsea Hospital and his Royal Palace work. So we'll divide it up into these four broad areas. So his earliest work in Cambridge was Pembroke College Chapel, which was commissioned by the Bishop of Ely, who happened to be his uncle. So his uncle, although he'd been imprisoned a lot, as I mentioned, he also came into his own and was able to sponsor this college chapel at Pembroke. And this is thoroughly classical. You can see the classical pilasters, the pediment design, the Corinthian columns and the, the windows, very classic design like those designs he had copied from looking at Vitruvius. What's interesting is that we can see on the left that there's actually no doorway into the street. The doorway into the chapel is from the college. So it, it wasn't for passers-by or common people, as it were. It was specifically for the, the college itself. Later on, he designed Emmanuel College Chapel in 1663. And you can see here how if this is a much more ambitious and sophisticated design than Pembroke College. And this developed from an original idea in the late 60s, which was it wasn't completed until the 1670s. But you can see here a sort of a classical portico, the pilasters and Corinthian columns, and then an arcade very much in the classical style. He also did work in Oxford, and here we have the Sheldonian Theatre, which was a very strange sort of D shape. You can see the curved rear of the building on the left, but it had a flat facade on the front. Again, it's got the, the portico, the classical pilasters, and it was based on some of the drawings. They, these were circulating by architects, 16th century Italian architects like Serlio, who in turn took their ideas from some of the, the Roman ruins, which of course were, were visible in Rome itself. The theatre was open to the sky, the Roman version, but of course a roof was needed in England. And Christopher Wren very carefully managed to roof this very strange D-shape by using overlapping timbers, which was very clever. And later on, an image of the sciences was painted on the inside of the ceiling. Back in Cambridge, Wren designed the library at Trinity College in the late 1670s. And this is really amazing. If you look at the size of this building, we've got, again, the classical features, the pilasters, the arcade, the statues along the roof line of, of classical figures. But look how light and airy it is. This is a massive building, a massive library. But the windows in the upper, on the first floor level, have an amazing transparency. You can see right through the building. It's really light and delicate. And of course, light was a very practical use um, because it was a library and light was needed to look at the books themselves. So his design seemed to be evolving. And of course, his most famous evolving designs were related to St. Paul's Cathedral. So there was a huge focus on St. Paul's. On the left, we have an image of the old St. Paul's from a view by Wenceslas Holler. And you can see it's very Gothic in design. It's got a, a, a Gothic line buttresses, a Gothic spire. It was struck by lightning in 1561. And the tower was in danger of falling. The spire was in danger of falling. And Inigo Jones, in fact, on the right, you can see, he tried to reinforce this. The, the spire went 
and Inigo Jones, the famous 16th century architect, placed a classical portico on the front. This is an artist's impression of what it would have looked like. But it doesn't really fit in with the Gothic building behind. It's rather a, a hodgepodge with this classical portico on the West Front. And during the Cromwellian period, it was used to stable the, the horses for the military. Glasses were smashed. Houses and shops were opened in St Paul's and adjacent in the port. So St Paul's was really rather a mess by the mid 17th century. And so in 1663, a royal commission was set up to investigate what to do about St Paul's. And the big issue was whether to repair it or to replace it. Now, in spring 1666, the first designs were drawn up by Wren with a dome to replace the spire because, as mentioned, he'd been in Paris, he'd seen domes, domed buildings in Paris, and he'd seen images and talked to Bernini about St Peter's in Rome. Quite a few people submitted plans to do this. And, and as I said, the whole idea was whether to repair or replace it and put a dome on it instead of a tower or a spire. And the idea was to outdo France and Italy because, you know, England was coming up, as it were, or Great Britain by then. On the 27th of August, 1666, this design to repair and replace the spire with a dome was accepted in principle. As most people might remember the school rhyme in 1666, London burned like rotten sticks. Everyone remembers that the Great Fire of London took place in 1666. This design to repair it was approved on the 27th of August. But then on the 2nd of September, the Great Fire of London took place. This could be a coincidence. So I'm not saying anything. Wren was actually in Oxford at the time, but it seemed fortuitous for Wren that it all burnt down about a week later. So the fire ranged from the 2nd to the 5th of September in 1666. So the whole thing about whether to replace it or repair it, the decision was made. It had to be replaced. Now, this enabled Wren to develop his wildest dreams for a dome and couple that with the plans for a whole new city layout, because the, most of the city of London, almost all of it, had been burnt to the ground. And so by 1667, a rebuilding act was passed by Parliament, and it was agreed that it would all completely have to be re rebuilt, the ruins had to be removed, and this took quite a long time. This is an image of the city of London, the bit in, in the centre there is what is now called the City of London, the Finance District with the Tower of London on the right and leading round the, the sort of the green area to the left is what is now Oxford Street and so on. And then with Westminster down the bottom of the, of the left hand side. So the City of London was the main centre. And this is actually where St Paul's still stands in this lovely old map. Now, as I mentioned, as well as redesigning St Paul's, Wren had really great plans to redesign the capital. And this really provided a rare chance to design the whole thing focused on St Paul's on the west and Gresham's Royal Exchange on, on the northeast. And so these were all being developed after 1666 and several plans were submitted. Robert Hooks submitted a plan. John Evelyn, who had also been to Rome, and the idea of redesigning the city of London with Renaissance ideals and plazas and boulevards was really there with symmetry and order. But it got very complicated because of the fire and the property and what, what happened and, you know, whether this was a lost opportunity or whether it was just as well that the city of London remained more as it was. But this is what happened. This shows you the two areas where Wren focused his design on St Paul's on the left and Gresham's Royal Exchange on the right. So Wren set out to redesign it and influenced by what was happening on the continent. On the top left, we have a Greek cross design and that was built as a model. There were several designs, I'll just focus on the main one. 
the Greek cross design was regarded as too heavy and a bit too Catholic, a bit too like St. Peter's in Rome for what was now a Protestant nation. The model is a huge model, which is in St. Paul's itself. There were different designs. There were actually five altogether. They led up to what is called the warrant design in 1674. And you see here on the design on the right that he was really trying to please everybody. He's got a, a dome with a spire on the top. It was funded by coal tax and donations. And Wren was called for from Oxford. And this was the definitive design because it had the royal warrant, warrant design. So it was a Latin cross with a dome and a spire that was approved. But it was actually stated in the contract, as it were, as it's noted underneath, that variations were possible. Variations as from time to time he should see prosper, which I don't think would get past current planning applications and planning laws in the UK or elsewhere nowadays. But basically this was agreed, but he was allowed to vary it, which he certainly did. So the last drawing is on the left, and you can see that St Paul's on the right, this is what it looks like now. The dome was begun, the foundation stone was laid in 1675. There's a story that as they were digging the foundations, the word resurgam on an old piece of masonry, I will rise again like a phoenix rising from the ashes. Um, and this became a motto for St Paul's. And it was used for services before the dome was completed, because you can see that the dome wasn't begun until 1711. And it was completed when Sir Christopher was very nearly at the end of his life. So it became not just a church, but a symbol of monarchy, a symbol of power, the power of the city of London, the commercial success rather than simply the church, the power of the church. And, and this is what it still is in the centre of the business district in the city of London. And you can see here the way he's got all the classical motifs, the pediment, the sculptures in the pediment, Corinthian columns across the facade, these classical pedimented windows with the triangular pediments, and the this sort of grandiose Baroque idea from Bernini in those two towers looking at these broken ideas and the way they, the towers are articulated above the main classical facade. Well, what I found interesting is that if we look at an aerial view, you can see that a lot of these facades are like screens added in front of the building. They actually cover up, you can see on the left, which are like actual Gothic flying buttresses. So is still using some Gothic tradition of building, using flying buttresses to prop up the enormous nave and to prop up this colossal dome, which apparently weighs about 70,000 tons. So these huge buttresses, so as to keep the classical outline of the building, are covered by a screen below. And here again, we can see how it still rises above. There are laws to protect it from having too many large buildings around it or protecting the London skyline. But the design problem to fit a huge, such a huge dome on a long church and the way it all fits together is important. I just add a note here is that I'm speaking to you from St Albans. There is a St Albans connection because the family of stonemasons, Thomas Strong, Edward Strong, and his son, Ed, also Edward Strong, was the chief mason to Christopher Wren. And they settled in St Albans, just near where I'm sitting now. And there is a plaque commemorating this local connection in the local church here. And it records how Edward Strong was there when he laid the foundation stone and was also there when the last stone was laid on the top of the dome when it was finished. So we've got. Wren as an astronomer and Wren as an architect. And I think that the, the two aspects of his career really come together significantly in the astronomical elements of St Paul's. The domed architecture 
domed architecture is traditionally cosmological. It, it's really a dome architecture is imitative of the scriptural idea of the flat earth covered by the dome of heaven. And domed architecture dates back to ancient times, but in particular in church architecture. And it was revived in Italy in the Italian Renaissance. It's significantly 365 feet high to the top of the cross on St Paul's. And the Southwest Tower was actually set up as a scientific instrument to, for pendulum experiments and telescopes. And also its orientation, the orientation of churches, they all have the altar in the east. And quite often the orientation was where the sun rose on the saint's day of the church in question. Just briefly in, in Genesis, some of these reference the flat earth covered by the dome of heaven and God sits on the circle of the earth and stretches out the heavens and the view of the universe as, as domed architecture was reflected in art as well and in architecture. And you can see here that St Paul's London is just smaller than St Peter's in Rome, which in turn is a fraction smaller than the Duomo in Florence. And the Pantheon, the ancient Roman Pantheon in Rome, is larger still, the modern Millennium Dome in London, which also has astronomical ideas. And Santa Sophia in Constantinople, slightly smaller, but of course much earlier, it was sixth century. So we've got this huge tradition of not only domed architecture, but a link between astronomy and architecture. And you can see here that when he rebuilt St Paul's Cathedral, the orientation was changed. On the left, we have a plan of the medieval St Paul's with an orientation due east. And on the right, we have the new St Paul's after Christopher Wren built it, which is changed and points north of due east. We can see that perhaps more clearly if we look at the two plans superimposed, you can see how Wren rotated it slightly. And this seems to me to be very strange. We can see it also in a, an example here taken from Google Earth to see how St Paul's does not point due east. Now, some people have maintained that this was simply to fit the site that was left after the fire of London. The scaffolding was set up by 1673, so that's about six or seven years after the fire. And then it was staked out, and we know that the foundation stone was laid in June of that year, of 1705. But why? why? Why should the orientation have been changed? I think this is an interesting astronomical question. It could have been just to, sit the, to fit the site. It could have been to do with the foundations, because, of course, on the banks of the river Thames, there's a lot of sand and gravel and clay to deal with and the ruins. To have the foundations for such a massive church is really, really difficult. Perhaps Wren still had hopes of implementing his city plan, and this was to be part of a, a focus of a boulevard. But then going back to the astronomy, it seems to me that Wren was such a, so important and such a well-known astronomer, professor of astronomy, that if he changed the orientation, it wouldn't have been just on a whim or just to fit the site or something. So it could have been because of sunrise on St Paul's Day, because the, the actual point of rising of the sun, of course, varies between the two equinoxes. So it could have been because it to fit with sunrise on St Paul's Day or sunrise on the day that the foundation stone was laid, which is in June, or maybe the spring equinox or Easter. We have also to remember that England didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar until later. We could actually find out the orientation of the church, assuming a clear horizon, which it would be because the whole of London had, had burnt down. We can see that the orientation is at sunrise in March. And because of the difference in the calendar, this would have been the 21st of March. And as you can see in the table on the right, Easter sunrise was on the 23rd of March in London at this time. So it seems quite clear that his astronomical ideas 
went over into his church design and his architecture and that he reoriented St Paul's Cathedral to fit in with the Easter sunrise at that time. So just summing up here, not St Paul's Day, not the Foundation Day, it was to fit in with Easter, the Easter sunrise, which again has the feeling of rebirth, the phoenix, livening up again. And I don't think this could be any coincidence. Now, the other astronomical aspects were the Southwest Tower I mentioned. There were special rooms in this tower and there was an aperture for observation at the top. There were fittings for pendulums and experiments were carried out there with Robert Hooke. And Huygens, the famous astronomer, donated a telescope to the Royal Astronomical Society. And the minutes of the Royal Society confirms that a telescope was planned for this south corner of St Paul's and that astronomical observations were made. So I think that shows that Wren's astronomy was permeating his later work as an architect. If you go inside St Paul's, as we can see on the left, it really is of cosmic proportions. It really does look cosmic. And this was recognised in the 19th century. The Victorians chose to decorate the ceiling with a creation cycle which, again, has astronomical, cosmological connotations, the creation. And you can see, looking up Ludgate Hill, you can see that the orientation is not where one would expect it to Ludgate Hill. I included this photograph, which is much older, of course, from probably from about the 1930s. There was a final stone or topping out ceremony in 1708 at St Paul's, where the the dome was built. But I like this image because the houses around it show how it towered above everything else, which there are sort of skyscrapers that's at a distance from it nowadays. We have to remember that there were 51 other churches that were destroyed by the Great Fire of London, and a lot of these were never rebuilt. Some of them suffered again from war damage or adapted to different usage. But here we can see a list of 21 churches that Wren had a hand in the design of. They're all known as Wren churches. He would have done the designs, but he wouldn't personally have overseen them all. It was rather like a, a huge modern architectural practice. So you can look back at that li list later on if you, if you like. And this is where they're situated in London. And the circles there were, were to enable me to walk around and take photographs of them all, which I'll just share with you a few of them. The feeling of the Wren churches in London and the idea that they're, they're very light, they're very airy. Some of them, the work was delegated to people like Nicholas Hawksmoor, a right, another rising architecture, and also rebuilding them according to the, the Church of England, Protestant post-Reformation ideas where you have more visibility of the proceedings and the and the preacher and you can see here that although it's been repainted you know the sky the the ceiling does seem to re-echo the sky with some sort of star images um, i've done a detail of one here in the middle of the bottom st mary at hill again is a similar sort of design the wren churches were really important they they came to influence quite a lot of international architecture like I was recently in New England and some of the New England churches do have echoes of Wren's designs and again very light very airy a lot of domes a lot of arches. St Mary Ab Church is unusual in that it's it's built in brick and that's quite difficult because it's got a very large dome which is held on brick walls so there was some buttressing involved and a painting in, of 1708 in the dome, again, depicts the heavens and the idea of the dome of heaven. St. Stephen Walbrook, I think, is, is one of the loveliest. It's very light in its weight, and it's got lots of illumination from lots of lights, letting in the light in the same way as the library at, at Cambridge, at Trinity Cambridge. And it was Wren's own parish in Walbrook. He lived in number 15 Walbrook. So I think that he probably had more direct links with this one, more direct overseeing of, of the building of it. 
and here are a few others just to get a feel, just to enjoy looking at these pictures and getting a feel for the different churches. They've had buildings around them now, but St. Edmund, King and Martyr, St. Margaret, St. Michael, some of the interiors, they're still painted in blue on the sky, making the barrel vault like the sky. And an interesting one, St. Lawrence Jury, out in the middle at the bottom, has the coat of arms of Sir Thomas Gresham. And you can see on this coat of arms, we've got stars and comets, which again shows how important astronomy was to the whole idea. The monument, jointly designed by Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke, was designed to be a monument to the city of London that had burnt down and an urn of ashes was to be placed on the top. It was, however, conceived as a telescope and used as a telescope and experiments on things like stellar parallax and pendulums were also carried out there with lenses, again, lent by the Huygens family. And so like St Paul's, the monument, which is quite near to St Paul's, was both a national monument and it's an oversized scientific instrument, as Jardine mentions. Other scientific examples in Wren's work were the Royal Observatory at Greenwich in 1675 to 76, which of course became the home of the Royal Observatory and the Greenwich Observatory nowadays in the museum there. And in this old print, you can see in the distance on the horizon, right in the middle, there is the, the residence, the house. I'll just show you that. Here is the residence where the astro Astronomer Royal lived. It, it's this house. I'll just flip back to the other one. So you can see there it is on the horizon in the, in the middle. So. Wren was responsible for designing these. And of course, Greenwich became so very important as you know, setting the Greenwich Meridian. Other royal commissions were the Royal Hospital in Chelsea in the 1680s, which was for the wounded in the European battles and is still going. But other designs of Wren's that had the royal connections, palace designs, did not come to fruition. A royal palace was designed at Winchester for Charles II. It was supposed to sort of be, you can see how familiar it is like Versailles, but Charles II died before it was completed. It was only partially built. It was used in fact for prisoners of war, French prisoners of war, and it was destroyed by fire in the 19th century. Other palace designs in, in Whitehall were again, designed but not entirely carried out. This was a massive project with 1,500 rooms in, in Whitehall under James II, the Queen's apartment and the chapel. James II, of course, had, had Catholic sympathies and so the chapel wasn't built. The chapel was built, um, it had a gold leaf ceiling but then there were fires and, and it was destroyed. But the present cabinet offices and the, the prime minister's residence at number 10 Downing Street were actually below what was designed as the Royal Palace because Queen Anne then moved the government to St. James's. Kensington Palace also had input from Sir Christopher Wren. As I said, he, he couldn't possibly have designed every last detail of all these and overseen all these designs. It was more like a, a, a large practice. And the image I just showed you of a, an 18th century drawing, what it would have looked like. The south front of Hampton Court Palace again by Wren. Just to finish off with now, his later career, having been instrumental in setting up the Royal Society in 1660, he actually, became president of it from 1681 to 83. His astronomical and scientific interest continued long after he switched from being a, a sort of professional scientist to becoming a professional architect. But his links with the Royal Society and contribution to Gresham College continued. He continued supporting research into the longitude problem, looking at this by using astronomy. 
he was active in scientific and medical circles still and still continued to do some astronomical observation, particularly with Robert Hooke and also at Gresham College. In fact, there were plans in 1702 to expand the Royal Society at Gresham College, which was at the time based in what had been Sir Thomas Gresham's large London residence. He died on the 25th of February 1723 at the age of 90. He had a very modest memorial. He didn't go for a a very grandiose tomb or anything in, in St Paul's. But in St Paul's, there is this plaque which commemorates him, which says in Latin, Reader, if you seek his monument, look around you. You can see at the last line of that plaque, Lector, si monumentum requiris, circumspice. Reader, if you seek his monument, look around you. In other words, he didn't need a, a vast tomb or a monument in St Paul's. His work was his monument in St Paul's, in all the other churches, in his university and college buildings, in, in his royal buildings, medical buildings, but also in his work as an astronomer. So his actual tomb looks like this. It's a very simple tomb. So he had a very long life and death. And it was his son who, who climbed the dome to finish it off. And the dome, as I said at the beginning, was really important and iconic. So Winston Churchill, in the middle of the Blitz, said that St Paul's must be saved at all costs because it did and it still stands for London. One of Sir Christopher Wren's tenet was that architecture aims at eternity. And I hope that I've, I've shown you some of his work, his work as astronomer, his work as architect, and, and areas where these perhaps overlapped and influenced each other for making a, a hugely long and fulfilled, very interesting career. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Valerie. Can I ask you a question about uh, Sir Christopher Wren as what I think you could describe as a supreme example of a Renaissance man. And would you draw comparisons with any other Renaissance men? I'm thinking, even though he came later, of somebody particularly like Alexander von Humboldt. Yes, I think Humboldt was rather later, but I think this idea of the Renaissance man, you've got well, Leonardo and Michelangelo spring to mind, where they both, some of Leonardo's drawings included cathedral design. He was a scientist as well as an artist. And Michelangelo, perhaps more primarily an artist, but he couldn't have designed what he did without being, to a certain extent, a physicist and a mathematician. Those were the sort of the Renaissance men of the 16th century. But I think by the 17th century, Perhaps we've got politics coming into it more. We've got Louis XIV building Versailles in France and this rivalry we've got um, after the Tudor age, we've got the Stuarts and then um, the Cromwellian period. But we've got England or, or Britain, Scotland being included after 1603 with, with the Stuarts, trying to rival these, these great European countries, rivaling France and Paris and so on. So I think we've got the sort of the Renaissance man where he was erudite, he knew about the classics, he knew about astronomy, he, he looked at ancient cultures, he went to Paris. So I think very much so a, a sort of, wouldn't use the word, jack of all trades. He was cut above that. He was way above. He was just an, an expert at everything. And especially coming as it was after, you know, pleasant childhood, but then a really difficult period when the royalists were, were really under, under threat and could easily have, um, you know, wiped out the family. But he came into his own again after the restoration. Uh, can I ask you a question? What staggers me is the engineering complexity of so many of the buildings. Now, did he have some support in the engineering design, particularly the massive dome in St. Paul's? Yes, I think he, he clearly would have done in the same way that, you know, Michelangelo did in, in the design of St. Peter's. But I think that, you know, you've got to be an engineer as well. You've got to know your physics and your math. 
But I think here it, it's probably Robert Hooke that would have provided, um, you know, I'm hypothesizing, but would probably have provided a lot of the reinforcing the scientific ideas as an engineer and a mathematician. In fact, some people argue that possibly Hooke was more responsible than, than he's sometimes given credit for. Hooke fell out of favour. Newton disliked Hooke and destroyed all his portraits. There is only one portrait of Hooke, which was, is actually a composite. It, it was done way after he died. Um, so I think Hooke was, was sort of left out of the picture a bit. And I think because Wren was also such a courtier, such a royalist, so important at court, that he was the focus for all of these things, but he cannot possibly have supervised and overseen all these buildings. It was like, as I said, more like a modern architectural practice where, um, you know, engineering, structural engineers actually come into it nowadays uh, as they did at that time. Thank you, Valerie. You've shared your expertise with us, but it hasn't just only been the expertise, it's been the wonderful visuals and, and the wide variety of aspects that you've presented to us. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>